Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have two uh, really great guests uh, with us today, Jim Sutherland and Tom Sharp. Um, Jim will be taking us through the, the, the latest scene that he's designed and will speak about work and play. And Tom Sharp, who contributed um, a story to this uh, latest extra issue, uh, will be uh, reading that out. For those that are new to Logo Archive, um, I'll be doing a quick introduction uh, just to get you up to speed. Uh, for those that have already know about Logo Archive, um, it'll be really short. It's just a quick overview and we'll get into uh, Jim's work and, and Tom's story. Um, the zine is available to pre-order now. You can get that at logoarchive.shop. Um, and for those that uh, we'd like to follow Logo Archive on in Instagram. You can follow us at instagram.com forward slash Logo Archive. So Logo Archive is an online archive of modernist logos. Um, initially began on Instagram, but we're building a website. This began in 2015 and since then uh, it's, it's now reached 187,000 followers. Logo Archive is also a collective of international Instagram accounts. Um, this is a decentralization initiative where I take all of the, the archive materials that I have and I distribute it to um, individuals in their respective countries and they're able to build their own audience and share their own visual culture. And each, each account is, is delineated by this sort of bright color. Um, if you'd like to follow any of these accounts, you can go to Instagram and just search Logo Archive. There's, nearly um, an account for most countries and I think they really appreciate your support. Logo Archive is also a zine series. We have nine numbered issues which I designed and six extra issues. This began in 2019 with Blair Thompson's Canada Modern issue um, and has included um, design studios such as Bank of Vessel, designers such as uh, Hugh Miller, who worked on Akagare, and Darren Leader, who designed Logo Redux. And of course, Jim Sutherland and Tom Sharp helping him here uh, on the latest extra, extra issue play. Logo Archive fundamentally is a, a new way to look at old things. Um, it'd be very easy for me to just publish a book with all of the logos in, but it doesn't really move the conversation forward. Um, each collaborator, um, has brought something new and surprising to the series. And Jim Sutherland is really no exception. And it's no wonder when you look through all of his achievements. Uh, for me, introductions are, are really difficult, particularly when you have someone who has achieved so much. Um, it's tempting for me to read all of these things off. However, uh, I would much prefer something more personal, something that sort of expresses my own experience with working with Jim. Jim described himself on a call with me as a court gesture, jester, but he's really no fool. While there's a lot of joy in his work, it's also very purposeful. And I hope this is really reflected in the, this latest issue of Logo Archive, which Jim will speak about now. Over to you, Jim. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. I need to go back to the beginning. Well, thank you for that, um, Richard. Um, I much prefer your short list to the long one, but we'll come back to that perhaps. So uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about, about this, uh, working this issue together with um, Richard, how it sort of came about and the sort of discussions we had. And then uh, introduce Tom, who's going to do a reading of his um, wonderful story, um, which will become apparent why it's in here in a second, hopefully, why in a bit. So uh, quite early on, I think we had a discussion about play being the theme. So, and then noticed, luckily, that the word, uh, the logo for Logo Archive fitted within the, um, the word play. But I just wanted to just talk a, a touch about my sort of, um, uh, interactions with Richard and Logo Archive over the last couple of years and uh, and talk about play and work. So I've got a collection of these, some of which I'd already bought, some of which Richard sent me and some of which I got since uh, we've been working on it. Um, 
I think it's been a, a really wonderful thing to see over the last few years and a really um, beautiful sort of concise collection that's building up um, in lots of ways. But the first one I, I went to the launch of with, with Bank of Essel, a wonderful um, Swedish um, design company. And I went to the launch, met Richard again, spoke to uh, Ida and Jonas and with print, the people that obviously have produced quite a lot of them and just had this sort of wonderful evening of understanding what this project was about and um, talking to everybody there. And that was really the point when uh, I just remember thinking I'd really like to do one of these. I didn't quite know if I could just ask Richard or whether I had to wait to be, <laughs> wait to be asked. Um, and then once we'd started working on it, I think probably in parallel, suddenly this one appeared, uh, which Hugh Miller had done, which I just thought was amazing and suddenly took it to another level of this. I mean, it's absolutely beautifully printed and you fold this thing out and it's this really precious object and you're unsure whether to, which is relevant to later, whether to pull it apart or whether to just keep it as this wonderful object. Um, and for me, just suddenly, I, it made me really nervous seeing this because I thought, well, what are we going to do now? Because this suddenly has sort of raised the bar, I think, in some ways for the, for the collaborative issues. Um, and then recently I watched uh, uh, Richard and, and Darren Leader, who, who designed this issue, uh, talk about this. And um, I haven't got a copy yet, but I plan to get that on Friday. <laughs> But I thought this again just sort of changed the direction of it. And this is a collection of um, these just amazing, I think, what, 15th and 16th century printers' marks, which Darren had researched and then designed this issue around this. And it's a set of cards with this, with this sort of wraparound, um, like really beautifully put together, just so fascinating as a real precursor to sort of, uh, you know, mid century modernist uh, graphics. So um, all of these things were sort of inspiring and also a bit daunting at the same time, I would say. But I just wanted to go, I suppose not really back, but just to talk a little bit about definitions of play. So this is just from the dictionary and I think it's really interesting. And, and I think hopefully we'll come across in this talk about how I view play and work and the difference between them and how much they overlap. But I think particularly that first um, definition about engaging in activity for enjoyment and recreation rather than a serious or practical purpose. And I think I really, I know it is the definition, but I think I really disagree with it because I think you can play and it can have a serious and practical purpose. And, um, and maybe that's just the way I look at it, of trying to not really look at things as work, but look at more as play that work comes from. Um, but anyway, so that was the definition of play, the definition of work that suddenly all becomes tasks that need to be undertaken or things that need to be done or made or things that are manufactured or require physical effort. And again, I feel a bit like, and, and we're going to touch on this hopefully in, in some of the discussions, but at one point talking to Richard and we were talking about how much, uh, you know, about blood, sweat and tears, how much you have to really work to get something to to work for a project and I, I it's not always the case but I try really hard to really enjoy the process and I think you do um, I feel anyway more joyful work if you put joy into it and as soon as it becomes a bit of a sort of uh, stones in your shoes exercise I think you lose some of that even if you're creating really beautiful work um, and this is for me it's not for everybody um, and I've interspersed a few quotes, um, but I think this one's particularly lovely. Uh, children need the freedom and time to play. Play is not a luxury, play is a necessity. And as I say, I, I hope that's what we try and do in the studio. So as a bit of background, people don't know, I run, as Rich mentioned, um, a studio called Studio Sutherland. It's just myself and one designer, uh, Rosie Trickett. Uh, we have lots of projects on all at the same time. And I think one way to manage all those projects is to have uh, try and enjoy doing them all. And generally, I think this is the case, uh, we don't really have any projects we don't want to be doing. So I think that we're a very fortunate position in that way. Um, so I started to do this slide and it said early workings. And I thought that was going against my principle that it's about play. But I realized that playing isn't a word. So um, this is early workings and play. Um, and one of the exercises I did, and again, I feel this does jump around a bit this presentation, because there's lots of things I wanted to touch on, but 
I went back when Rich and I talked about doing an issue together and um, I did invite myself so people know. Um, and he said yes. And, uh, and so I did a bit of research about all the ones that had been produced so far and uh, read the essays that, that Richard had done or other people had put in the, in the zines. But I also sat there and drew lots of the logos and I found this was a really good way of pausing a bit rather than just flicking through of actually studying these logos and doing really terrible little sketches of them. But it made me really look at the shapes and the forms and you know how these things were constructed. And um, I feel that comes back to this idea of this issue of a certain amount of, of uh, you know, getting away from computers and actually sort of hand drawing things and really looking. And I think the act of drawing, which obviously I'm not really good at, is, is an act of, of trying to understand the shape. So if you look at those, say the bottom left ones here, you know, this is quite a complex symbol and it took several goes just to understand how these very simple triangles or sort of arrows built into this beautiful um, symbol. Um, this is another quote I found from a book, which I'm going to show in a second. And um, I will read this out because I think, again, I, I, I just love the sentiment of this. The master in the art of living makes little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his love and his religion. He hardly knows which is which. He simply pursues his vision of excellence at whatever he does, leaving others to decide if he is working or playing. To him, he's always doing both. And I think perhaps... A, Again, I'm making this up as a theory. Perhaps I'm not thinking it's work or play, but maybe it's something in between. It's not saying it's always play and you have to work hard, but there's some in between. I don't like this idea that it's either one or the other. Um, so I added this picture in. This is a, a, a truffle pig. And um, this did come about from discussion with Richard where he was saying, you know, that there was a, there is a one school of, not one school, but Certain number of people in design think you've got to work really late, got, you know, the whole blood and sweat and tears thing. It's sort of painful. You've got to go through lots of disappointments. And, and I, I don't disagree with, with some of that. I think you do have to work really hard, but it's not hard work. So I love this analogy of a truffle pig that is just rooting around, having a really lovely time whilst doing what he's supposed to be doing as a job. And I was reading about them the other day. They've started using dogs now quite a lot because the pigs got so excited, they started eating all the truffles. So they've decided that they can't use, can't use them anymore. And I love that when I read that, I thought that's so lovely. You just get a sense of excitement that they're really hungry and they wanna eat these things that they're supposed to be digging up. So animals will reappear slightly later on. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about process. So when we talked about this, this uh, issue being about play, I wanted to make it playful, lots of you know, could we make it physical in some way that you can play with the zine itself? Folds and, uh, you know, wrap arounds and use of the word play. Could we do logos that form the words, things like this? And these were just early conversations we had. And so the process very much worked, obviously, because it was during lockdown, some of this, that we were just talking online with Zoom and I was making things and sending it to Richard and then getting a response. Um, and it sort of led to this idea, which was a sort of folding that you'd have this, again, really rough, crude, uh, you know, handmade visual, just to get that idea down, get your hands moving and get your brain engaged, that you could fold uh, effectively these in and they would create the logo types. And I really like that idea of creation, that you had half logos that then folded in. And that's what would complete the sort of puzzle in some ways. But what I felt, or I think we felt was interesting about it is it felt quite restrictive. You can do this one thing and that's, once you've done it once or twice, that's it. And the, even though the reveal is rather nice, it doesn't really give you much else. And what that led to was thinking, well, maybe we were talking about the game of pairs, that you could do a set of cards and effectively you have to find the other half of a logotype. So suddenly the whole zine became the idea of a game. And I think this was probably the moment that it started to be, I think, much more interesting as an idea and, and kept sort of ratcheting up ratcheting up or sort of developing slightly so it started with these and this was just visuals from one of the previous issues um, of cutting them in half and then you can you know obviously start to separate them out and you've got this set of cards and the idea being you can play a game effectively of putting the pieces back together um, but what then really happened and I was looking this up today about the definition of a chimera and I think this is a lovely um, it's a lovely word in itself but the definition again, it's essentially a simple organism 
that's made up of cells from two or more individuals. So it contains two sets of DNA with the code to make separate organisms. And I think there's something really wonderful about that because what we found quite quickly, perhaps because of the collection um, being quite modernist and from a certain period of time, you know, everything is quite uh, geometric. It's all um, quite solid shapes. So what it means is that all of these really combine in lots of different ways and almost whichever one you put next to each other, it almost forms something else. Um, and these were just some early tests and you just get this wonderful um, uh, playful moment where you've got these bits and you just start to put them back together again. So then we um, approach with print who I, I touched on earlier, who I think have done an amazing job with this. And you can't really see on this visual, but um, on this dummy that they made for us in different weights of paper we were testing out, but the whole booklet is perforated. And we had to do quite a lot of tests on different weights of paper that you could either tear, but it doesn't fall apart too quickly. So this one appeared and, um, you know, just in any colors that they had, because we just need to know that it's possible to do this idea that you can effectively perforate the, the zine and turn it into this set of cards. And the lovely thing about that is you then take this A5 zine of however many pages and you end up with whatever different papers you have with this little stack of cards. And I love this bit at the end where you just get these two staples. So you just deconstruct the whole piece. Um, and then, so we had that test. We realized the idea was going to work. Richard then came down and we had an amazing afternoon where he brought a lot of his um, books and references down. And we just started going through them and choosing logotypes, working out which ones would fit in the would fit in this issue and um it was just such a lovely process and it sort of started off like this as the day went on more and more bits of detritus sort of appear cutting stuff out you know just really quick rough visuals which is a way i really like working of just as i say sort of engaging your brain by using your hand making stuff um and just to touch on i suppose the what was the criteria for selecting logotypes and i think it would have been easy to do an issue on play and just choose overtly playful logotypes and, and symbols and some, you know, things like this, where you've got animals and you've got this lovely, you know, chicken and an egg, and you've got this um, wonderful medical symbol of, of the, uh, the snake. Um, but I think I, we were also really keen to use in some ways for me, just as playful symbols, like the British steel logo by um, David Gentleman, I think is just wonderful that it's just one shape that's repeated. It's so beautifully drawn. The one on the left is these three, are these four T's for this textile company. So for me, I think these are just as playful as these. And I love the fact that in this scene, we've got that S for a snake, as well as we've got the British Steel logo. And, um, and I found this the other day, and it's just another little separate point to make, but the other thing about this is that all of these symbols were drawn by hand. This is all pre-computer and yet they're so beautifully crafted in some ways more so than because it's easy just to get on a computer and draw stuff up and get things to align. You know, the fact that, you know, all of these were either drawn by hand with um, rotaring pens or, or ruling pens or cut out of ruby lift film, I think seems amazing now that that's what went on. And um but again, I think this that sense of handcraft about something that perhaps adds a bit of humanity to it. So this became the initial sort of logo selection. Again, very rough, us just cutting bits of sort of scans out and seeing which ones could uh, form this idea of pairs. And again, this sort of detritus, there were just lots of ones we tried and, and for whatever reason, they didn't quite make the cut. And, and I, I quite like recording some of this. I think it's part of that whole um, story. Um, and then starting to form these, these chimeras. And I think that perhaps this was the central idea at some point was flipping it from, don't give people the symbol they have to then uh, pull apart and recreate, but actually give it to them in a, in a form they have to pull it apart in order to create the symbol itself. And so these, again, uh, I suppose it's worth saying, this is when you're playing of just which ones go together and trying to work out, which really did, I can't say this was playful because it really hurt my head, but trying to work out which ones went on the back of which other ones, which meant you could still form enough symbols so you weren't missing something on the back. Um, and so this was sort of quite late in the day having played a lot. 
it became quite hard to go. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of coffee and not much food. Exactly. Yeah, but it was um, it was it was it was really good fun to do. It was hard, and it did. And I have to say, this exercise has been really interesting because even from this stage, this was the bit that started to hurt our heads most. I think the rest of the day was just mucking about, and then thinking, "Oh, okay, no, maybe we don't do that one. Put that one over here," and having to rejig them a bit, you know. I was, then, I was concerned that we'd reached a point where we'd come up with an idea, and it was really interesting. But then I thought. But what if it doesn't work? I know, I know. So I'm still not entirely convinced. I know you are, but even though we've worked it out sort of mathematically that you can't obviously make all of the symbols because the cards are printed back uh, back to back. So you can make you can make them in sets, can't you? You can make a certain set and then you mix them up again and make another set. So, um, so we did that. And then the next exercise, so you do this and it's quite rough and you think, well, that's going to work, you know is actually getting the master logotypes and, and symbols and um, just actually trying to get them all to perfectly align uh, as much as you can, obviously knowing that you can mix and match them. And this took you know, a lot of, quite a lot of time and quite a lot of effort because you changed one half of something and it affected the half of something else. So I suppose this comes back to the point about work alongside play that you have the fun of just cutting stuff out and being a bit of a sort of, you know, being at a nursery school with bits of glue and things like that. And then at some point you do get on the computer and it has to be, you know, does this align? How does it fit with the grid and all those sorts of things? Which I personally think can be as joyful as the other, perhaps not quite as joyful, but can be joyful, I suppose. Especially when you get it to, to work, you know. And when you look at some of these that are all mismatched, you know, how on earth does that work so perfectly split down the middle here? with that bird and this candle or starting to look at it's nice putting what were I think water drops but next to half an eye and you get a nice sort of um, narrative almost between these things and they start to form their own symbols and I think that's really interesting as well and also I think the point that it, which I think you made Richard several times that that these are quite sort of sacrosanct things in manuals that you're not supposed to you know, cut about or crop and do this sort of stuff. And suddenly we're taking 32 of them and just cutting them all in half. So, you know, is that sort of allowed, you know, by, by someone? I've started to feel that um, whenever I get nervous about uh, working with a collaborator, that's when the interesting things are happening. If right. I don't feel challenged or I don't feel scared, then perhaps it's not gonna, gonna work, right? Mm. So that led to some of these. So these are just some of the sort of chimeras we started to create from the, the book when it's, when it's um, printed white onto colored paper. Um, the cover itself, was, we were trying to work out, well, which one do we put on the cover? Do we put a lot? And obviously ones in the past tend to have one big logotype on the front. So this was an, uh, a beautiful symbol drawn up by Shigeo Fukuda in 1967 which happens to be when I was born, which I decided this was fate, which I quite like, um, that uh, I just used quite early on because it's one of the symbols we had from the previous issue uh, had been used small. And because it's sort of made of components, it does just break up really nicely that you can get a sense that these pieces, almost like Meccano, are going to fit back together. So that's what we've used on the cover. We then were thinking, well, if you've got these little set of cards that you've you've deconstructed the book to play with, that we need, uh, well, two things. One, you need an envelope to put them in. And secondly, some sort of piece of paper that has a key or a legend that shows you what the symbols are supposed to look like. And um, so the, just that thought of the economy of combining those two things so that you can use this as a key. This is a little A7 envelope that goes in the set and um, but has obviously the legend um, printed on it. I think this again is a really uh, lovely sentiment. Um, do not keep children at their studies by compulsion, but by play. Again, if you look at what's going on in the education system and about how it's just become about testing at every stage, you know, for me, a lot of the, the, the learnings you can get through play are getting taken out and out and out. And it's almost this sense that, yes, you can, at an early stage, you can be mucking about with plasticine and glue and scissors and but at some point you have to put all that stuff away and you just have to start using calculators and um, filling in timesheets and all that sort of stuff. And I, I think it's um, much to the sort of 
the detriment of imagination in lots of ways. Um, I've just got a few more bits, but uh, the, the other bit I wanted to talk about was just, there was something about wanting to create um, some, I suppose, sense of, of having work and play within this zine. And this was an exercise I'd been working on a while back about just playing with the letters of play. And I didn't really know what this was gonna turn into. So it was just a, a little sort of mental exercise really, but I was having a lot of fun doing this. And then I did the same with work. And actually the letters of play are much nicer to use than work, which I think is uh, interesting in itself. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe we could do this in the zine and this become cards and you can sort of interact with them and make other words or other shapes and things. And then I looked at it and, and we talked and realized, well, you've got this wonderful graphic uh, that's been created for the logo archive uh, itself. And so I started to think, well, maybe the work and play should all be done with the shapes that are in that, um, in that logo itself. And again, this is another sort of sketchbook thing of just scribbling lots of ideas and repetition and how to get this to work. So this was an early visual of just the idea of creating the word play and work out of just very simple symbols and shapes, but obviously reflecting what happens with the logo archive um, logo. And then once you get those shapes, you can just again play with them. And it really relates to a lot of those wooden toys that you get, you know, from Vitra and places like that. They're just very simple symbols. And it almost, you have more imagination because you can create more things because they're abstract shapes in the beginning. Um, but obviously in the zine itself, just to make it more difficult, instead of it saying work and then play on the end papers, you've got half the word play, which is the left hand, uh, and then half the word work, which is the right hand. And so you don't know what these are and no one's gonna know unless they watch this talk, but you can uh, basically just use these. If you want, you can create work and play, um, or you can start to create your own names. So um, fortunately we managed to do Rich and Jim, which is helpful. Richard might have been a bit harder. No, no, we were not. So um, this is another, uh, and I think this leads very nicely into uh, Tom's story, which we're gonna get to. If you wanna be creative, stay in part a child with the creativity and invention that characterizes children before they are deformed by adult society. And I just, I love that thought that you have to somehow go back to that point before everyone's told you to stop doing this and stop doing that. And, that's uh, childish. And I suppose it's that point of being childlike instead of childish. So what that leads to is, um, which I'll introduce Tom in a second, that, that, that interestingly, we had some of these ideas quite early on. And I remember conversations with you, Richard, about you saying we had a sort of theme of play, but we didn't really have an, a proposal or an inquiry about what was this about? What was people supposed to think? You know, were we making enough of a sort of statement? And um, during this exercise, I was reading this book called Play and um, written by an American uh, doctor and uh, or professor. He's got this lovely byline about how it shapes the brain, opens the imagination and invigorates the soul. It's a very American book. Um, I found it really interesting. It talks a lot about why humans play, why animals play, what we can learn from animals, what the benefit of playing is to uh, ev you know, the evolution of the, the human race. So really interesting, uh, you know, not, it's not a hard science book, it's sort of a popular science book, but I found it really fascinating. And I'm not sure I would have got around to reading this if we hadn't been doing this exercise. And in some ways I was trying to keep up with Richard being much more academic of those in the way that you write about a lot of these things, so. So in this book, there's one short chapter about the fate of the sea squirt. And when I read this and Richard and I talked about it, I remember this little moment, almost like a light bulb going off above your head going, this is, this is the inquiry. This is the bit we have to feature. And then just before Tom reads his story, uh, we've worked, Tom and, uh, and I have worked together on, or have worked together with us on a number of projects and you know, ongoing like collaborations and with clients and things. So I remember just thinking, reading this, thinking well, I, should, I should ask Tom if he's interested in writing this. And um, so I sent him a note with a bit of this story and said, would you be interested in writing a short uh, piece about it? So this is a sea squirt and um, which obviously is this sea creature which eventually attaches itself to a rock. 
and Tom is now going to read a bit of his story. <clears throat> Thank Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, so this is a cautionary tale. So um, do uh, listen closely and uh, pay heed to the uh, the message within. Uh, so this is um, how the silly sea squirt lost its brain. Journal of Play Studies, Volume Two, Thirty Eight to Forty Five. <clears throat> All the wiggly ridiculous, jelly-thoughted, bubble-eyed, and star-spiny, deep-sea, couldn't-make-it-up ocean goddesses that gloop moon-bouncingly around beneath the chubby, hurrying ships, the sea squirt is quite very the absolute strangers. Stranger than the crow crab, stranger than the elf whale, stranger than the telescoping mollusk, would you be curious to hear why? Of course you would. To begin at the big spinning. A million cloud of shedded eggs meet some busy, busy sperm for a nice bit of fertilizing and then praise Poseidon. We're finding little lava-like tadpoles swimming everywhere. As free as water can be, can be. As free as water can be. They are gilly glorious, fantastic, and life is all deep imagination blue, and catch this current, catch that current, up, down, every kind of circle, and they excitedly think, let's go wherever our thoughts may take us. Somewhere up beyond is the boom of waves buttering the beaches. Oh, shall we go there one day? Go for the tumbling surf, go for games in tides of time. Life is possibility. Life is a whole world of turquoise reveal and inky peaking and wine green and lovely navy play. What have we here? Rocks, polished rough by steady salty pressure, a comfortable craggy base from where we'll sit to catch food as it floats richly by. Feed first, play later, seems sensible. Careful there, steady in place, an interesting vantage. Fix for a moment, switch off for a while. A pleasant reduction of the cerebral ganglion, the vertebrate brain controlling movement. Digestion of unwanted, unneeded organs is another sensible move. Conserving energy for the future. Digestion of the cerebral ganglion. Digestion of brain. Thoughts like a falling coastal shelf. Far away, hidden from the sun, deep cold echoes of turquoise remember dreams. We, they, we are scientifically known as tunicates, more commonly known as sea squirts. They are sessile, immobile, permanently attached to rocks or other hard surfaces on the ocean floor, developing into a barrel-like and usually sedentary adult form. Marine filter feeders with a water-filled sac-like body structure and two tubular openings known as siphons, through which they draw in and expel water. During their respiration and feeding, sea squirts take in water through the in-current or inhalant siphon and expel the filtered water through the ex-current or exhalant siphon. There are sensory cells on the siphons, the buccal tentacles and in the atrium, but there are no sense organs. That's fabulous. Thank you, Tom. I'm glad you read that out, not me. <laughs> so um, Tom wrote that story and sent it to me. And I remember thinking, one, it was amazing, but I was thinking, I wonder what on earth Richard is going to think to this, having just heard about the sea squirt story and this wonderful piece of, I think, really, I mean, we'll hopefully we'll talk about it a bit later on, but just creative writing that completely uh, embodies this idea of of, um, of of losing that sense of play, you know. So um, once we had this, we then thought, well, it would be lovely to to put this in the in the zine in some form as a little storybook. Uh, I liked the idea of creating a, a sort of modernist logotype for a sea squirt. So these were some initial sketches. These were playing with um, the S and some punctuation. There's a lovely thing which you might see when you see the story itself, um, rather than just hear it, about the amount of, of punctuation that appears towards the end. At the beginning, it's much longer. 
um, in, in sentences and things. So something like that. And then this is the, the small insert that goes inside. And I love the idea that um, at some point, Tom's going to write the rest of volume two as well as volume one, I think. Um, the other thing, which I think is a stunning piece of uh, serendipity, is that we were reviewing the papers at one point about which ones to use. And we had two blues to use. And I remember we, we were going to use one. These are all from Jeff Smith and wonderful stocks. We were going to use a paper called uh, To Breeze for the blue. And then Richard said uh, that he preferred one called Adriatic because it was a slightly duller shade of blue. We felt maybe for the sea squirt story, it looked a bit more sort of academic papers and things. And then you mentioned the other day, didn't you, the fact that it's called Adriatic. And I love this idea. I don't know if sea squirts appear in the Adriatic Sea, but that's just a completely sort of coincidental moment, I think, um, which I want to draw your attention to. Um, the other thing, whilst this is going on, I went for a little trip to Eastbourne uh, with, with my daughter and my wife. And we're walking along the seafront and we'd been talking about this sea squirt story and I suddenly found this, which is like this discarded children's toy, which I decided is a sea squirt, even though it's the wrong colour and doesn't look like one. Um, but I think this is the other thing that happens for me is that these things just keep overlapping. And once you open your eyes, you just see things like this and think, oh, that's a bit like that thing we were talking about last week, you know. And then uh, just to end the bit about the zine, the, the, uh, the sort of collation of it. So this is um, how it's all come together. Uh, obviously all the typography fits within the grid, which you can see on here, the, 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 you know, the, the whole of it, uh, every page splits into eight cards. Um, inside you have the, the shapes that make up work and play if you want on the end papers, um, on the inside back front and back covers. The uh, sea squirt story starts at the beginning and then and finishes at the end. So you have to go through the book and it sort of um, uh, bookends it in some way. And then inside, we've just done a series of these uh, chimera, chimera uh, logotypes. And um, again, this, is, this was so much fun um, to put together. And you can't believe how well they all align. I think it's um, incredible. Um, and then the first copies literally turned up this morning. So Richard got a couple and I got a couple. So these are just shots I took on the floor. Uh, and you do, you know, I spent 15 minutes literally just, you have to, you have to be quite careful with it. You have to fold the, along the, along the uh, perforations and then tear these out. And it's a really interesting act of getting this, I think really beautifully produced print um, by with print you know, in every sense, uh, the printing, but also the alignment of the perforations. And, and you just tear the whole thing to pieces. And it's a really odd sort of sensation. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, but I'm okay, because I've got another one. But it feels like you're sort of destroying something. It's, it's, it's really, uh, really interesting, I think. Um, so you end up with this set of, you know, uh, different colored cards. And then you can just stack them up as a little set. And so the C squirt story splits into two because it's perforated down by the spine. Um, you have the bigger stack of all the logos and then you have the cover, which is obviously got play and work on the back. I think one of those things that's worth mentioning on that is the, the way that you'd set the grid up. Uh, you'd found a way to um, not leave anything redundant, that it all had a part to play. There wasn't like a, a spine that was left yeah. that we didn't know what to do with it. Just all stacks away nicely. Yeah, there's, there's a real economy. And I love this fact, it sort of, for me, really rates nicely to the C squirt logotype, that these are, you just left with this set of cards and two white staples, which are perfectly, is. they just fall apart as you, as you pull the whole thing to pieces, you know. And it becomes a, a material manifestation of the story, right? That the, the story is about the degradation of the yep. sea squirt. And here we have the booklet itself is being degraded by that sort yep. of, interaction of course there's the, that tension as yeah. you mentioned um, that designers seem to have where we want things to be pristine but yeah. also you know you want to get involved and play with things and cleverly as a sales technique it means everyone's got to buy two because they can <laughs> tear one to pieces and then they can keep a pristine one in the in the lovely little envelope so um and then the other piece which i really liked this we were talking at the uh, at, when we were doing this the fact that you do have to tear it quite carefully and it helps if you fold it first and 
And so we're saying maybe we put a little one of those little sort of like errata slips in that just says, this is what's, you know, what you can do with these cards. And then I said to you, could you write, you know, a short statement to put in this? And you came back with this lovely piece about there are sort of two games, work where you put all the actual logos together uh, or this sort of chimera idea, just create whatever you like. And you had a wonderful thing that you mentioned um, your partner, I think. Yeah, so um, I, I, I gave the, the, I made this up, I printed it out really quickly and I handed it to my girlfriend because she's a, she's a dentist, uh, not a designer. I just wanted to see what it would be like for someone that isn't um, uh, sensitive to certain aspects of it. I wanted to see how she would respond to it. And I could see while she was doing the pairs, she was very methodical in a way a dentist might approach things, right? Very pragmatic step by step. But I didn't see too much smiling, right? Um, but then I said, right, well, you mix it up and now you can just do whatever you want with it. You can make your own pairs. And I saw her face light up and there was a lot of fun and joy in it. And that's when, when you, it, it just kind of like, we've got work here that it seemed like a lot of effort. And then there's play where it was just like, undirected and when you asked me to write this it, it just all fit yeah. together so nicely that we had a duality to it and um, I talk about the zines as being these complete objects that it doesn't tell you it's not um, uh, it, it's it's not prescriptive but there's enough in there for you to construct meaning within it um, and just this kind of thing where it was an instruction suddenly took on new meaning right it helped you understand what what the, the the inquiry or proposal was about yeah and interestingly when we started this it was very much a game of pairs where you just created the logotypes which was still a lovely thing to do you think oh that one goes with this one it's a really nice you know that game that you play where you turn the cards over but actually it's turned into that being one of the games and the other one just being create what you like with these and I, I meant to look this up earlier, but if you've got these effectively 64 cards, you know, the number of different combinations and so many of me put together and just think, well, I haven't seen that before. And then you're almost wondering, does that actually get, you know, is that the symbol or is it something else? So, and the other thing I really like, just as an aside, that, that it followed the grid that you always do with the, the designer and the country and the date and who it's for. And it means you can't actually find that out until you, when you get the zine, until you actually deconstruct it and put them all back together again. So, And I like that it's also an invitation, right, um, for other people to construct their, their own chimeras. And I'm really interested in that hybrid between print and digital is, can you get something print and encourage people to put that online, to make their own things, to post it, to yeah, tag it, yeah. uh, to sort of use that community that Logo Archive has and to really sort of generate that interest and in engagement. Um, and just to finish, because we'd like to have some, if we've got any questions, things at the end, we're having a little uh, mini exhibition uh, starting on, um, we're going to set it up on Friday, be open Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it's in a really wonderful space at uh, Deanne & Co, who are an excellent, um, oh, fantastic uh, design studio back but down in South London, not, not far from here. Uh, and they have a ground floor space, which they use for some wonderful exhibitions that I've been to. And um, so we had this, well, you'd had this idea, we had the idea of having a mini exhibition, if we could, of calling it um, Spielraum, which I thought had a lovely, I don't know if you just want to talk about that as a, an yeah. idea. So uh, I think you've taken this on as well. It's like every morning I'll, I'll read for an hour. Um, I have to put things in. Um, and this was something I come across like years ago, this, this idea of having running space and um, not being too dogmatic uh, when someone um, uh, enters a space is not defining it too much with stylist like ornaments, um, you give people space to construct their own meaning um, and it just felt like it had this very uh, a relationship with what we did we do in, in graphic design is that there's this temptation to tell people how to use things or even tell people how to think in graphic design um, like you know you get a bit of profile and you start telling people you know this is how you should be doing it I'm quite the opposite I prefer to have 
ambiguity and I think this scene has it we create a lot of different points for people to just jump off and and form their own opinions and take that and, and make something of it mm. and this is what I wanted to do with the exhibition and and that's where it comes from is where Jim will show some sort of um, mixture of texts and aspects uh, of things activities to play with we're not telling you this is what we we believe in we're just giving you lots of different things to bounce off and, and try and construct your own sort of ideas and take away uh, things to take away from it. And I added this, this in this afternoon because I found these pictures that you sent me. I don't know a lot about this, but this was an exhibition in 1967. Uh, this is really, really interesting. So Paul Rand, um, as part of his work at IBM, rather than constructing um, a, a, like a, a design policy through a brand guidelines, what he wanted to do was change the culture of IBM and what he did was he created the IBM gallery that uh, would bring in uh, international designers and artists for IBM um, employees to immerse themselves in, in design right? and one of those exhibitions was uh, Shigeo Fukuda's work. And this again when you sent me this I think this idea for me I suppose as a the idea of an exhibition that you can play with stuff and, and you know, muck about with it, that it's not just a sort of white walls with beautiful art on the walls and, and all that sort of idea. So, so what we've done is we've, we've well, we haven't, um, with print, our printing at the moment, uh, these big A2 sized half cards um, and uh, with all of the 64, um, you know, half logos on. I thought what was really interesting about this is that, you know, this is just one card reversed. So just to check the sizes and things. But when I was sending this to Richard to try and show him the scale, first thing to hand was a pair of scissors. And I really like this idea you're cutting up these things with this tiny pair of scissors. But um, here's an amazing visual of what it's going to look like. But I only had five bits of card when I did this. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I, I think we're going to work it out on Friday in some ways, but We'll have this stack of cards. I quite like the idea they're on the floor and people will just make stuff and then photograph it and then change it around. And maybe somebody will come in and actually, you know, perhaps we should start with them all in the right place and then people deconstruct them, you know. So it's just that thought, very simply done, just on pieces of cardboard. There's something lovely about the um, cardboard. So they almost feel like those logotypes that are printed on cardboard boxes or containers and things. So feels it really fits with the, the the sort of aesthetic in some ways. And then there's also a couple of other pieces which you've um, reconstructed, aren't there? Yeah, so this, this is a piece from um, an exhibition in Milan in 1969 of Shigeo Fukuda's work. Um, and, and within the, the announcement booklet, there was this sheet um, that you would cut out these uh, slips of paper and you could construct a cube. But actually, it's quite difficult to work out how to slot this all together. Um, and again, it felt like a bit of work and a bit of play. Um, and I just thought it'd be really nice to bring that activity into the exhibition space rather than just having uh, logos on the wall, which is what people always expect of logo archive, right? Is can we do something that is involving, has a, an idea behind it um, and, and discovery? And then this is this is another piece by Shigo Fukuda. Um, it's 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 this this has been sort of ripped off many many times uh, since, and in quite poor quality. But it's a really beautiful um, modernist graphic expression that um, he built into this physical object to play with. It, it's like a like a, a jigsaw puzzle, if you will. Um, but Fukuda, he, he grew up in a family of toy makers and he just found this lovely intersection of the graphic and the material. And we really wanted to bring that to life. And we're printing it once, oh, we're cutting it from compressed yogurt pots, which I felt was a very playful material in itself. Yeah, yeah lovely. And so that's on, as I say, uh, Saturday and Sunday uh, this weekend, if anyone wants to come down and have a play. Um, and just to finish on a couple of things, this again, I think is a lovely um, quote about the opposite of play is not work, it's depression. And I think that's uh, wonderful. And certainly for me, uh, you know, if there are times when I do get quite uh, 
you know, down or a bit worried about what's going on or stressed, play is the way for me to get out of that, I think. So, so just to finish, we thought we might have some questions, but obviously I had to make Q&A out of the symbols from the booklet, which got really complicated. Um, so then I thought it might be better just to do a question mark and an exclamation mark. Wonderful. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the, the Q&A box. We do have some questions. Um, I just wanted to touch on the, the sea squirt story. Um, play is a, is a really interesting aspect and each person sees it differently. Um, for me, the, there's, a, there's a joy in when the booklet almost completes itself. And I'm always looking for that, the, the piece that makes it more than just a booklet of logos, right? That it, it's, a, it's an idea expressed in uh, a number of different ways and it doesn't literally tell you what it's doing. And the sea skirt story just really brought it all together that the, the metaphor employed um, that, I mean, maybe I shouldn't just explain it to everyone, but that the, the, the need to play, to, to continue to go out and find things, to discover things was, really so important to me because I, I have to push myself every morning to read for an hour, right? And without that, I would just become static and I would end up uh, receiving everything from Instagram, right? Rather than having that agency. And for me, this is the proposal is that play is agency, that uh, desire to go out, to find things, to discover things, to bring that back, to find new ways of sharing that with other people. Uh, and I think that the, the story, it's veiled, right? You have to think about it. It doesn't, what I typically do when I do a zine is I'll write on the back exactly what it's about, right? I'll put it plainly. But I felt what the story did was it did it in a far more beautiful, elegant, creative way. And it meant that I didn't have to explain it. It was another way of sort of delving yeah. into the, to the idea. Um, and the other aspect was the work and play. Um, Jim, you, you said that maybe we should sort of somewhere say that the, 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 uh, the shapes make up the word play and work. But I said, well, no, I think, I think people are very perceptive that once they read the words work and play and on the back of the text, yeah. that they will get it right. And, and this is what I mean about just having a bit of space for people to get it instead of telling everybody this is how it should be. Yeah. I, I thought there was a really, which I'd perhaps would be interesting to hear Tom's view on this, but when, when you sent me the story, and I remember saying to you, mainly because I was worried about sending it to Richard about what he would think about this, this slight change in shift of, of, of what you were used to publishing. But I remember saying to you, should we just add at the end, you know, this is the parable of the sea squirt who stopped. And I remember you just looking completely horrified. And sort of saying, if I've got to do that, then I've failed in the way that, that I've told that story. But yeah. is that your recollection of that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I think I think uh, when when a piece of writing is successful, it's just like when a logo is successful. The logo um, invites people into it and to kind of to play around, to let their consciousness and their mind play around with the shapes and and what what the story that's being told. So. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I can't claim credit for for uh, discovering the metaphor for sea squirt, but yeah, that concept of going from that playful language to that very stilted language, I, I think people hopefully get that. I don't know; people can tell us whether whether it's successful or not. Yeah, I I I think it's wonderful. It took me some time. I suppose that was the bit. I in a very I would say lazy way, there was a bit of me thinking, oh no, it just needs to be a sort of straightforward story. And you think, well, that's going completely against all of the ethos of doing this booklet and what I think about design as well as writing. And so it's, I think it's interesting. And as Richard has just mentioned, really, that idea of pushing yourself, I think that's uh, is really interesting. Is it? it is like the C-squirt, it's just easier to sit on a rock and wait for food to drift past. Mm -hmm. and you don't do any of these things. You just think, well, you just find these logos in a book or you can look them up online or, you know, so um, I think it's, and it's also like trying to, um, and this is a psychology thing, trying to keep things stable and static and safe. It, it's a very scary world we live in, and and sometimes we sort of we go back 
for the nostalgia uh, mm. to feel um, secure or we want to keep things pristine and in order to feel secure. And so there's a tension there between that desire to want to play and discover new things, but also the fear of like changing what you are. Yeah. Um, that's embedded for me in the story and in the booklet. Um, I remember early on what I wanted was an academic text, right? And, uh, and this is my safe space because I know how to write like that. Um, and I always want that sort of uh, purpose and inquiry and proposal element. But when I read that story, it just, it, uh, th there's such a, like a joy when you are challenged and you get it and it's, it, it really adds something to the zine that it, it hasn't had before. And I think if you look at the zine, its composition is very similar to the other ones, right? It's yeah. the color plan papers, but actually it's got so much more to it. And when, it, when we did Akagare, I thought, what on earth are we going to do, right? That Hugh had gone and done something so oh. elegant and yeah. yeah. Um, and it's almost documentary-like, right? Whereas this, it's almost like you took it back, but also exploded it out in another way, right? Uh, and, and, I, and I really hope people enjoy and get stuck in on that. And again, I like the way that the, the transition of words from something very, very playful uh, to very, very sort of formal uh, was wonderful. And um, I've got a couple of questions um, from the from the audience, so I'll, I'll read these out. Yeah. Um, Ahmed says um, he loves the amount of work and play put into this uh, issue. Do you have any advice on balancing play in uh, fast paced work environments with tight deadlines? I think that's really interesting. I, I think perhaps this comes back to a sense that if you're playing and experimenting and searching around for an answer, then you're not working. And I think that's the danger of feeling like, okay, you do have deadlines and it's fast paced, but there's some, I think, strange, and we've all done it, you know, the feeling like you've got to be sitting at your desk working, otherwise you're not going to get a solution. And actually often you get the solution when you're not doing that, you're actually, you know, it doesn't mean you don't, I mean, I think about stuff all the time with notebooks and things like that, but that's where the ideas come, not when you're just, sitting at your desk trying to bang something out and everyone's thinking well you've got to be sitting there otherwise you're not working and so I think there's um I, I said it does come back to this sentiment that it's it's not like you just sit around all day and you know on bean bags and and you know read oh. magazines and just you know smoke various things and it doesn't I'm not saying that doesn't work I'm just saying that doesn't it, it's a sort of weird uh like you've either got to be sitting at your desk doing that or that's play you know just mucking about I think it's somewhere in between. And I love that quote that it's not one thing or the other. You're just doing it all the time, whatever it might be. And, and so I suppose it's having in some ways, as, as if you mentioned earlier with your reading, the sort of discipline of, of thinking, well, okay, we've got something to solve. And, and funny enough, it's something that I'm jumping around, but Jonas from Bank of Essel said, it's sort of about the trusting in the process that you just got to start and, and the answer will come as long as you just keep thinking about stuff, keep feeding things in, something will come. You know, if you go to an exhibition, I have more ideas about projects we're doing when I've gone to an exhibition than I do just sitting at my desk. So the other thing I'll just add, sorry, just <laughs> is, um, cause I thought about this quite a lot. The, the, the other way I think we solve a lot of stuff in the studio is Rosie and I sit and talk about it. And so often you just have a conversation that can be quite fun. It's not like, oh my God, we've got to solve something by tomorrow. The amount of times we both feel felt a certain amount of pressure about have we got anything right yet and how much time have we got and then you sit down and have a conversation about it and it's not a single time we've not got up with more solutions than when we sat down um, and whether that's play or not but it's certainly not a sort of hard conversation it's just quite an open discussion about what we might do and scribbling things and making crap models for stuff that's often where the ideas come from. So in some ways that is the work, you know. Yes, that, and going back to the the and the, the, the C squirt is the it's the channels that pass you by, right? If you always look to Pinterest or always look to Instagram, the, yeah. the, the the type of information that you receive will always be the same. Yeah. 
Whereas if you, there's this sort of notion of factual reasoning where you can look at things from different points of view. So if you read an anthropology text, a sociology text, art yeah. review, um, um, then, then you can reframe the way you look at the problem, right? You can look at it from a sociologist point of view or an architect's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this wonderful scene in, I think, a Japanese film where there's uh, two uh, two shots, but in between there's just a shot of a, a vase, right? And it, it holds on screen for five seconds, right? And the director never explains what it, what it means, right? But you have this entire uh, interesting sort of ecosystem of um, everyone trying to construct meaning from that. So architects have got a point of view on what the vase means in this movie or the art critic, right? And I just think that's a, a wonderful thing. And that's what I try to do with the zines, right? Is create a thing that mm. allows for that projection to happen. There was a lovely point, if funny enough, in that conversation that Tom and I had about Tom's most recent project that we've been working on together about um, game six, which is about this famous chess game um, from 1972. Uh, and a lot of that conversation was about ambiguity and not being sort of exactly defined. And it's funny how that's exactly the same as you're talking about now. And that's the, really the sentiment that came across Tom, wasn't it, in that project that when we launched it a couple of weeks ago, the beginnings of it, people were just saying, other, some people are reading one thing into it, other people are reading something else. And that's what makes it more powerful because suddenly you're engaged, you're not just being told this is this and, you know. Yeah. I, always, I always think that a, a smarter person will read something into it and do something better with it. Can, can, I, uh, can I just, uh, can I comment on that, that the fast paced yeah. work environment question? Because yeah. it's, it's an amazing question. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether this is, I don't think it's counter to what you're saying, Jim, but um, I mean, I, I think that uh, inevitably uh, capitalism and all the current system of capitalism will decline. So the idea of us um, uh, all being comfortable with fast paced work environments with tight deadlines, which is conducive to no human being on earth, yeah. uh, will start to crumble. And the way those things will crumble is that the more play in our lives will start to push back against that kind of um, yeah. rather mechanistic system. Yeah. I think what's really interesting as you say that, it's funny that, that I remember an old client we had at Hattrick when after I'd left and I was talking to her about, you know, what it was like working with Hattrick and stuff like that. And, you know, she was a fan about the work and that stuff. And she said the most interesting thing for her, which perhaps I shouldn't mention this in case there's any clients here, is that she said that you never pushed back about budgets particularly or anything like that. All you ever said is you wanted more time for that first stage because that's where the magic was going to happen. That if you do rush stuff. And I, I think the question is interesting because it does assume that everyone's got to get used to that. But perhaps that is an answer in some ways is to push back and try and get more time, you know, and because that's where you're going to get something much better than rushing around doing something that's sort of OK in that time. No one knows in I don't know a few years time when that project's been out that the concept stage was really pushed and no one cares at that point. It's just what comes out. Was the idea any good when you did it? So. So we have a, another question. Uh, what is the meaning logic behind the, the colours chosen? Well, we had to use uh, that Adriatic paper for the blue, <laughs> which we didn't even realise. Um, I think that is a good question, actually. Obviously, I think once the sea squirt issue sort of appeared or the, the, that idea, I think blue was going to be used for that. I do remember, funny enough, the earlier visuals, a lot of them were orange because I was thinking doing something quite joyous in color was, was good. And then um, I don't know after that, I think we just looked through the GF Smith book and thought, which colors do we like putting together? We knew they had the different elements. Um, I think the, the one thing is like um, each, in, each scene is in its own individual thing, but actually it's always part of a series, right? Yeah. And they have relationships with the things before. And you don't really see that in, in publishing today. Typically you publish sort of the latest news or, you know, yeah. sort of hot topics, but it's quite interesting to see the whole thing and think how, how do you design to fit within that system? And there's another yeah. question that actually relates to that, but also distinguish it and I, I do like that kind of aquatic green and then the yeah. 
classical blue. I think that kind of royal blue was a really nice way of differentiating it from what had come before. Yeah. In relation to that, uh, was it difficult, uh, a question from Graham, was it difficult to let go of the formalities of previous scenes in creating this one? Um, presumably that sort of, it, it's kind of the, Akagari said you can almost do anything. Yeah. And you look previously and think, well, do we need to bring it back again? Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting in some ways, I think because it, because of the whole idea of just completely pulling it to pieces into these cards, I felt in some ways that making it more straightforward than Akagari when you first got it was quite important so that it almost has a more extreme change from something that you sort of recognize. And then, as I say, it's so beautifully produced that the perforation guides you could almost miss, couldn't you? If you didn't know, it just feels like one of your, again, always beautifully produced um, scenes. But it feels like it is almost that, and then you suddenly spot, oh, hold on a second, there's some, there's some perforations here, and there's something else going on. So I think it was, um, in some ways, making it straighter in order to be able to be more uh, playful with what you can do with it. Um, but there's a, um, you know, it's worth saying, that, you know, my relationship with with logo archive and zines and collecting them, you know, you you want to be part of this amazing collection, so you don't want to. You know, you don't want this to be not as nice as the previous ones or doesn't fit in. There was a lovely moment. Well, when I, when you first sent one of the old artworks over to look at the grid, I love the fact that we've only had to move the grid a little bit here and there to fit with that perforation grid. Uh, and so it almost looks the same, but actually if you check it, everything's moved a mil or so away. So there's a there's a lovely bit, which is to get slightly angry at it, but... Um, that some of the uh, cards, let's see if I can find one here. You know, the um, all of the text fits perfectly, you know, into these little cards. So they don't break it apart. They break where the paragraphs break. Um, you know, even the cover one, whichever one it is, God, this, this is so much fun to play. <laughs> even this becomes like a little card that just says logo archive extra issue. So in some ways that question about letting go of the formalities it's almost we kept quite a lot of it but sort of invisibly that then you can pull it all to pieces and and just to reiterate that point it it was it was really interesting this morning when it first turned up as a first time i'd seen the whole thing together and not just a test piece that actually tearing it to pieces was really quite like not traumatic but just should i do this or should i just leave us alone you know um, it was, it was really, I think it's interesting whether people do it, uh, you know, they need to do it for their, for their own sort of souls, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like that it's, it's the first time that the, the grid system is visible, but almost yeah. invisible, that yeah. the, the grid system is material. And I, I think I said to it a few, few times to you is that the, the digital is so ubiquitous in our lives that um, it takes up so much time that when you move to the material object, it is somewhat odd in comparison to that sort of amount of time. Yeah. And then we should always maximize that oddness, that sort of strangeness. Um, and I just love that the, the grid is actually very material. You just couldn't do this as a PDF, right? And I, I think that's the most important thing to me that Akagare folds out yeah. transparencies. This you tear up. If we were just doing what exists on Logo Archive Online, it, it just doesn't justify why it's printed. Yeah, yeah. No, this absolutely becomes a really tactile uh, piece, doesn't it? And, and I mean, the other, again, well, I'll say it because it's that when you stack them up together, these edges are a bit like a sort of deckle edge because they've all been perforated. They've just become this amazing... Uh, and obviously I've not shot it very well, I just showed it on my phone, but amazing just tactile object. I think it's, it's, and you're just looking at it thinking, oh, I just love the fact they're all aligned, but they've got this sort of decal. Um, and that actually helps them fit back together when you're, when you're making the pairs. It's this sort of nice little tooth guide that, that fits them together. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, there was a question about, um, are the logos from different places and times? So usually we're looking for a theme, right? 
But when we started to, to get involved in this, we weren't looking for like eye logos. We were, it was more of a, sh so previously it's an objective experience, right? Yeah, you yeah. say, I'll pick out all the eyes or all the people. But here it was a very subjective thing. And this is where the collaboration is quite interesting because we had different points of view on yeah. what we thought was playful. And I almost felt a bit embarrassed, right? When I was thinking, okay, this logo for a toy company or this, this animal, I kept on going back to animals and toys. And then you sort of drew my attention to, well, don't you think this is playful, this repetition? Mm. Um, and I learned something from you. Um, and we, that sort of subjective backwards and forwards really shaped. Could you maybe speak about how we went about sort of choosing? Well, as we touched in the, the, uh, the presentation, I thought it was really interesting having things like the British Steel all over type and then that S of a snake that's the medical symbol. Because in some ways, superficially, there's a sort of similarity, but one's got an eye on it, so suddenly it becomes a playful, you know, uh, uh, animal-esque you know, animal sort of symbol. And the other one is purely for me that the cleverness and the beauty and the idea of the British Steel symbol is it's the same shape, just flipped. They fit perfectly together, the craft of it, all those sorts of things. For me, make it playful. You know, there's a playfulness just in, and, and for now, if I just, I didn't put in, but there was a wonderful bit that was in um, uh, some story I read about designing that symbol, where he had it made in two bits of metal that were the same shape and repeated. And he, and obviously now it's been dropped and they've got some horrendous thing that they've put in that's, you know, over-designed. And, and you think they should have just, you know, kept with that. So for me, that was as playful. And I suppose that, that's the um, the selection issue was was interesting because I think after a while I think perhaps with us and then we when we knew we were doing these chimeras it became as much about uh, either symmetrical or asymmetric shapes or blocks or not being too fine to print at a certain size but I did find interesting that, that even though we we ended up you know discarding quite a lot there was such a playful exercise in just trying this with that and sometimes you know, the front of something just fitted together with so many other ones. So it's quite an arbitrary selection in some ways, isn't it? It's the process that selected it, not, not a criteria that it's got to be this subject. And as you say, it's not just company, you know, logos for toy companies or puppet theatres, which is sort of where it had started. And, and there could be an issue of just playful logotypes, which would be lovely, you know. Yeah. And I quite like that idea that we almost put forth a proposal of um, this is how you could try and generate logos in the future, right? If you yeah, put yeah. out all of your logo options for your clients, cut them in half and then put them yeah. together, yeah. you may actually end up with something really yeah. distinctive, right? And break you from maybe something that's a bit more controlled. Because yeah. that's what's really interesting. As you put quite a lot of them together, some of these you have, I'm just looking through them now. You have to almost think twice, thinking, oh, is that actually the right connection? You know, there's something that's creating really, as you say, it almost becomes a process. It's a bit like those Brian Eno cards, isn't it? That just sort of throw you into a different place. So just chop up logos and start, well, like the, um, uh, you know, uh, the way of writing where you just chop up sentences and just move the words around. You know, do you suddenly create something new, don't you say? So, yeah, and um, we have a question from Andrew English. Uh, when you're working on multiple projects simultaneously, and th this is very you, Jim. You, you <laughs> I don't know how you how you manage to fit it all in. And um, how do you manage your time and avoid just flitting between them? So sort of giving substantial time to. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. A lot of people work in a way that I'm today. I'm focusing on this, and then tomorrow we we'll work on that, or you know, this afternoon we we'll work on that. That's not what I found. I, I get so excited about everything. I like, and as Rosie will say if she was here, that I like working on lots of things at the same time. I like the fact that we're in the midst of talking about some big project we're presenting tomorrow, and suddenly I start talking about something else, or Rosie just says, oh, well, let's talk about that at some point. We suddenly have 10 minutes talking about that. And for me, I don't feel it's like flitting about. It is this idea of focus and distraction. So artwork in this book you know I came in on a Sunday in the end so it was quiet and I could just do it because it was really hurting my head putting them all together accurately um, but most of the time I, I think it's not the flitting it's just all of those projects for me feed, feed into each other really nicely I think so that 
you can be working on one thing and talking about it and suddenly uh, I read a lovely quote by an artist Edmund Duval I think talking about his writing and his um, you know art making and the fact that he didn't see them as separate exercises that when he was writing that would feed into his work and he was working it would feed into his writing and there was a quote about it's it was like sort of spilling over into something else he's doing and I, I love that thought really that they're not separate okay we're going to stop thinking about that and just think about this but keeping it open enough really. I think this is a good point to bring Tom in actually because he actually is a creative director and a poet. Um, Tom, how do you sort of move between these things and do they bleed over and help you? Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, akin to what Jim has just said. I try to see everything as a body of work. So it's all really the same, the same thing that I'm doing. You know, I, mean, I think that my commercial clients hire me for a certain kind of style and that's also like my artistic style. So it's all kind of the same, really. Yeah. Um, so it's just a body of work. But I also do make sure that every day I get up at six o'clock and by at least seven o'clock uh, or later seven o'clock, I'm, I'm sitting and I'm writing for at least two and a half hours, if not three hours. And that is just pure no computers no phones just writing so sometimes new things come out of that sometimes I will um, work on old things so I kind of divide the the pure creative time with the mm. creative direction stuff yeah. I think creative direction stuff I feed off flitting around yeah yeah I, just, I need it I get bored yeah. of it. which relates really nicely to the um, C square thing to come back to this is that if you just sit in one place and do one thing and wait for things to sort of drift past whereas that exploration you know mentally uh, I think it, 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 what you say is exactly right. Even though you're sort of focusing on this at this moment, all that's going to do is feed into what you write later in that day or vice versa, you know. So um, it, it, there's, I think there's, a, there's this sort of risk of over-specialization. Yeah. Uh, capitalism has kind of forced us into uh, trying to perfect a particular skill set and, and, and say, you know, I'm the best at doing this. But both you and Tom have this sort of um, not disparate, but quite broad, but interrelated disciplines that really help you um, inform different aspects of what you do. Um, I see, um, because I run Logo Archive, a lot of young designers that really love logo design. And, and they buy the zines because they love these modernist logos. But this is why each zine has to have 10% of something, some idea from somewhere else introduced into it yeah. that says, you know, there's some other things that are quite interesting that will help you and yeah. um, uh, that you might sort of draw energy and yeah. interest. Yeah. And I think perhaps that's a really good point just to touch on that, that thing that it gives, if you see those other things you're working on, it gives energy to you for those other projects. So it's not that if you're spending time on something else, it, 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 what it does is, is the opposite almost. It feeds into that. You do have to focus absolutely at some stage, but by doing something else, it's sort of giving a bit of energy to another project or another little insight or a different way of looking at it. So, um, We have a question from Dimitri. Um, hold on. Which logo epoch uh, do you consider the most playful uh, but at the same time workful? And... Uh, he believes that uh, nowadays logos have become uh, more pragmatic um, and correlated with sort of capitalist intentions, um, with the pace of life, and the sort of demand for efficiency, right? Things that are functional, that work on app screens and, you know, uh, over, say, he uses the word glamour, but perhaps we, we can say craft or... or yeah, yeah. Honest, maybe. I think it's really interesting because... I'm not sure there is a certain epoch where, you know, there was something more like this and that. I think, I think a lot of time, some of this work or any sort of design work goes through certain stylistic changes and things evolve. I think what's been really interesting working with you and looking at a lot of work that you've done, that uh, for me, a lot of the work is timeless. And I think even though it was perhaps done in a certain period, often I think, for me, the, the ones that work best are the ones that have a certain amount of um, humanity or, or, or it's really difficult to define is it what they have about them, but there's something about them that doesn't feel like somebody's just drawn it on a computer and done this. 
Um, and I think it's, for me, very interesting in lots of ways. There was a thing, I mean, it's ages ago now, about the logo being dead and everyone's moving into experiential things. And, but actually now with apps and, you know, um, Instagram, you know, that little mark, how you define something in this tiny space that says something that isn't bland, has some sort of humanity, some sort of personality, some sort of intelligence. I don't think it has to necessarily be wit, but it has wit in the sense of intelligence, not just humor. Um, I think it's becoming almost more important because we're surrounded by so much stuff now. I think um, a lot of it is sometimes to do with um, subverting expectation. There's one logo that I saw that was for a construction company and it was an elephant, right? And you you understand, you know, the strength, the the sort of the, the volume of the logo, but also it's quite unexpected. Yeah. I think the Bovis logo is another example. Yeah. And of course it's not modernist, but it, it is surprising um, and quite joyful in its yeah. Yeah. use of the hummingbird, a delicate bird for such a... Yeah, absolutely. It was completely groundbreaking at the time, wasn't it, as a, as a piece? You know? And yet people are asking questions about why have you given us... I mean, imagine that being in that meeting when they're expecting some industrial, you know, thing. Suddenly, well, here's a hummingbird. Um, Harry asks, uh, I think this is directed to you, Jim, a lot of your work is created from um, sets or modular elements. Um, is it important to get your audience to play as much as you do when designing the artifacts in the first place? The most important thing is that I get to play and uh, ideally other people get to play afterwards. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting how, I suppose I do have a, a joking part, a sort of thought that whether it's just play, but I do feel a lot that if you put joy into a project, I think hopefully if you do it well, joy comes out at the other end for the audience. And I mean, joy, not just in the sense of making people smile, but engaging with it or, or thinking about it or all those sorts of things. And I think often, for me, some work can be a bit cold and a bit unengaging. It may be beautifully put together and beautifully crafted and all those sorts of things, but, and, and maybe sometimes the joy can be in the craft actually as well. So I, for me, it's quite a broad church about not a certain style and things, but I, I love doing this. And so the more I can play and you can make things more playful, I think, I think the better, um, if you can. I'm not sure that really answered that question. <laughs> Um, we have one from Sajjad. I'm not quite sure I understand it, but I'll read it out. Um, I think he's drawing a, a sort of um, a, a, a comparison with the combination of the logos within the zine being uh, synonymous with today's chaotic world, right? Yeah. Everything is getting crashed together. Yeah. Um, it's like, I think a lot of it is these uh, brand collaborations, right? That they're yeah. just looking for opportunities to connect themselves with people that are doing interesting things but yeah. you just get this sort of chaotic world where everyone's trying to crash things together and hope that something interesting happens um so he asked do you think this gameplay uh, will emphasize new horizons in the world of graphic symbols um, well I, I think what's interesting about that is it goes back to those two points i think i'd make there one is the point you've made that maybe there's a something interesting to come out of this people could be creating half symbols and, and for their client, you know, things that you're not sure are going to go together and then you try them and see. So I think there's that. I think there's also, I, I quite like the fact that it does look relatively chaotic and you're a bit confused about, is that supposed to be the back of that bird with the front of the elephant or what's going on? But I think there's also a really moment of, um, for me, even though you mentioned earlier about it being a bit more uh, workful in some ways, but when you do actually construct the correct logos and you find that pair, there's a lovely um, just sort of simplistic moment or, or satisfaction that I found those two things that go together and they align perfectly. You understand that symbol, the text all comes together. So it's, it's, it's as it should be, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think that's, that's the other nice thing about it. Yes, you can go off in a slightly chaotic, playful place, but you can also very sensibly, um, you know, just put them together as they should be. And then you can stick the zine back together again with sellotape and have a complete proper zine. Uh, that, that's the, the last of the questions. I did have one, one I wanted to ask, and it was about this 
we've spent designers uh, have spent so long uh, what we describe as getting a seat at the table right at the top of boards um, and that perhaps that we've got to a point where we we almost have to justify and rationalize everything um, that uh, that that's how the business world speaks it's yeah. like why this why that how will it work and then we've lost some of the the sort of wit and humor yeah. that we see in Paul Rand's work and yeah, yeah. Kuda's work, and they were working with the sort yeah, of highest yeah. level of the board. But now we see today that a lot of identity systems for big tech companies are actually looking the same. And you, you think, yeah. well, you can clearly rationalize this because you can say, well, you know, this is the visual language that works. Yeah. Now. Um, have we got ourselves in a bit of a pickle? Well, I, I think I, I think that's a really good question. The, the analogy that I would draw is that slide that's been going around for the last couple of years about the fashion world, where you see what the symbols for I don't know Burberry and you know this whole raft, and it's a it's a slide that's all over the place on the internet. It has like I don't know eight logotypes for the fashion world and what they've now become, and in some ways more less obviously than the tech one. They're all using the same type of things, but they've all become this very sans serif chanel like you know uh anonymity and i think what's really interesting about it, you can see why they've done it they seem to produce they perhaps look a bit more fashionable at the moment they don't look old-fashioned but they for me have lost all of their soul uh, and obviously it's how they use it's unfair just to compare simple logotypes you know that, that depends what else they're doing but um i'm hopeful but that's because i'm quite an optimistic person i think that at some point it will go the other way and people will, will approach, you know, people like myself and Tom and just go, look, we want something back from that humanity and personality and engagement and, and wit and intelligence that somehow it's all just become yeah, a system and it's all working and it's beautifully spaced and all that sort of stuff, but it's almost lost everything else that it had. And I think it's such a shame for me with some of those sort of historic companies have just slightly just thrown it all away and just, and I think getting that back is actually more difficult than to me, they could evolve in some form, make it really modern, all those sorts of things, but don't, don't chuck away that whatever they had and actually, you know, make it look like every other person. It's crazy. I think. So I think let's, let's leave it there. Thank you so much, Jim. No, thank you for asking me to do this. And thank you, Tom, uh, for your contribution and for your reading. It's so lovely to have a poet actually read these things out. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, I just want to say everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the zine is now available to pre-order from uh, logoarchive.shop. Um, as Jim mentioned, we definitely recommend that you buy two issues. Um, please do play with it. Um, it's not there to just sit on the, the shelf. Um, we really feel like you'll get something from it. Um, yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom.